for um, quite some time now has been trying to essentially address this question, trying to get a picture of what um, not only the Earth was doing, but what the Sun was doing, to trace the solar terrestrial interactions back in time as far as we can. Um, I'm not going to talk so much about that. Um, I'll answer Kathy's first question today um, by the project that we've had. Um, um, we're very thankful for support from NSF from, I think, 2009. Um, and something we call the first billion years of the geodynamo, um, which in our interpretation is from 3.2 to 4.2 billion years um, ago. Uh, and yes, it's important for the for life. So here's Kathy. I've answered your first two questions. Okay, so now so we're done. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is obviously important for planetary evolution and the preservation of, of hydrospheres, we, we think. Um, I'm not going to talk about the preservation of hydrospheres. So I'll, uh, for those of you who are at EGU, I'll, I'll talk a lot about that. Um, I will try to get to planetary evolution. Um, but for the first part of the talk, what I'd like to do is to kind of dig into um, some of the details, get into some of the weeds of, of the background of this record, um, some of the debate uh, about it, uh, what convinced us that um, uh, of the fidelity of this record and what continues to convince us of this, um, hopefully in an interesting way to think about how um, we can um, uh, you know, continue to uh, look at these data and address, address some of the problems um, of the early Earth. So um, what we'll be looking at here is the Jack Hills. Is there a pointer around anywhere? There is not. Um, Okay, and there must be one someplace, but um, this is Western Australia, figure one um, B is, is highlighted there. Now to try to simplify this um, in what is a complicated geology, I'm, I'm just gonna be talking about a few places. Um, <coughs> okay, this works. Um, It, it sort of works. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to be talking about something called the Discovery Site, and I'm going to be talking about a conglomerate site. Um, and the Discovery Site is really important to this Jack Hills because this is where the oldest uh, zircons are known, up to 4.4 billion years old. Um, now, if we want to look at the oldest Earth's magnetic field, um, we, we sort of run out of extant rocks, rocks that I uh, haven't seen. Um, amphibolite or higher grade uh, metamorphism. So we have to be looking at minerals that are now found in younger rocks that might um, retain a signature of the magnetization uh, where they were formed. So already we have to understand that uh, there are going to be uncertainties here because we're not actually dealing with the actual rocks, we're dealing with minerals that um, hopefully contain magnetic inclusions that have preserved that uh, magnetic record. Um, what I'll talk about is this Cabo conglomerate first in the Jack Hills, uh, then we'll get to the discovery site um, and look at its components, and then finally the zircons that are actually from it. Now, why is the Cabo conglomerate site important? Um, this is uh, a Cabo conglomerate in the Jack Hills, and uh, it's a stretch uh, pebble conglomerate. It's the first rocks that really convinced us that uh, there might be something in the Jack Hills worth thinking about in terms of having a primary magnetization. And what struck us was that some of these are not actually stretched that much. They're, they're sub-rounded. And it's really going after a, um, uh, the idea that was outlined in the classic structural geology um, text and papers by Ramsey that uh, if, you're, if you find in this kind of stretched pebble conglomerate uh, some samples that are, are sub-rounded, they may have essentially undergone a, a rotation principally during the deformation rather than stretching. And there might be some possibility of having uh, uh, domains um, in the broad sense, not in the magnetic sense, uh, within these that might be able to tell us something about um, these early histories and whether or not the belt itself, this is now the host rocks that are containing the zircons, whether or not that has had a possibility of um, seeing through later metamorphic events. 
Uh, the first thing we did was magnetic um, susceptibility measurements. And um, I should mention that uh, these things took months. Um, uh, these are quartzites. Uh, you can't just go to a lab and just um, and measure these. Uh, that is, you have to get fresh um, tubes. You have to acid clean them. You have to make sure your blanks are down extremely low. Now look at susceptibility units. There's only a few here. Um, but we uh, convinced ourselves that there was enough consistency of these uh, close to um, 5 to 580 degrees uh, that there might be magnetite actually preserved in these, as expected because this is a mature conglomerate, and that's the expected phase in a mature uh, sedimentary rock like this. Um, there were also oddities. Um, here's one um, where we saw in the, um, the temperature, uh, there was a huge alteration um, in the temperature. And argon, we can see that we've actually created uh, pyrotite. Um, this is actually known in the literature from lots of other studies, and, and then subsequently uh, work by Matt Dare has shown that there is actually pure type uh, within some of these conglomerates. Um, I'll be showing you uh, quite, a, quite a few of these. Um, um, uh, some of these will have microfold analyses for the students. There's, there's going to be a quiz later, so I'll pay attention. Um, these are not secondary. Pyrite can actually be a secondary um, uh, mineral, but these are actually entirely enclosed by quartz um, the matrix here. So there. So uh, this is actually, in our interpretation, a depositional mineral. And that's one of the really interesting things about these rocks. We're dealing about um, the host rocks are Archean in age, three billion years, but they have um, seen all these um, even Hadean minerals put into them. And very strange things that you don't normally see associated with um, younger rocks because we're dealing with um, no oxygen in the atmosphere and the preservation of these detrial components. Um, here's other pure, um, pyrites. And I'll get to some of the other components in a moment. But if we're going to look at um, a field test using these types of rocks, well, what are we doing? Um, we're actually looking for a, any trace of a DRM or a PDRM. Um, now, that's, that's a tall order, right? You're dealing with a conglomerate, um, a quartz rich conglomerate. That's in a young rock, that's not a terribly good recorder. Um, but maybe there's still going to be some hint that this could actually be preserved. Um, this is just, Lisa, as you mentioned, that little worms probably weren't around uh, at that time. Um, the other challenge, and, and the huge challenge, is that we already know from the met, from um, metamorphic uh, mineral studies that this entire unblocking temperature range here is is lost to us. We know that these have been taken up to uh, Greenshift species metamorphism. Um, it could be a little bit lower, 420 degrees. We've chosen 475 degrees um, as as a value. Some people say uh, 480. But even with LA uh, relaxation, we should expect their single domain grains. This entire range is essentially expected to be um, uh, remagnetized due to uh, metamorphic uh, reheating. So it's really only this that we're looking for. Is there any trace of magnetic minerals that might actually record this high unblocking temperature magnetization? And in some of the best samples that we collected in these uh, first studies, in fact, we saw that there were. There were some high unblocking temperature magnetizations that were differentially recorded sometimes in only very small components of the, of the magnetization. Sometimes they were larger. And uh, this is what first gave us the, the concept that, well, maybe we should take a look at these. Um, and these were things that were actually presented at AGU. This will come important later. We discussed this with uh, what is the competing group at AGU. And these were the results that we presented. Um, and eventually, this was published um, when we had more data suggesting from these high unblocking temperature magnetizations that um, there appeared to be a positive conglomerate test because it was not the dominant magnetization preserved. However, um, we didn't spend a lot of time on the low unblocking temperature magnetizations. And there was some grouping of a few of these, uh, but uh, we didn't show the rest of them because we didn't spend a lot of time trying to define them. And um, one of the criticisms that one could make is that, well, maybe everything in the rock is, is random, and this is just not a good recorder. So uh, this is not really a very robust test, and, and we'll get to that um, later. 
Um, again, the magnetization that we saw extended uh, in some of our samples up to 580 degrees. And in the paper that we published in 2013, and, and, and Richard Bono has continued this, you'll have a poster um, today, that um, we believe that uh, there is a, a hint of this magnetization that um, there's some predepositional um, magnetization in the cobbles, but there are these subsequent events, particularly at 475 degrees at peak metamorphism, which is well dated at about 2.6 million years. A secondary event at probably uh, 1.8 and then 800, 800 is probably stronger. And today we have a complicated history of these low and blocking temperature mm -hmm. magnetizations because of these subsequent events. Now, as I mentioned, there were unanswered questions when we first did this study in the host rocks. Uh, mainly the nature of the low and bulking temperature magnetizations uh, and the and the low thread. Um, we uh, were also interested in this kind of interesting question, these two, um, sort of an unexplored area of, of rock magnetism and paleomagnetism and, and is, can we actually use magnetic mineralogy to say something about magnetic provenance? Uh, and then finally, is there actually a, a hidden Hadean rock fragment in some of these, these larger uh, conglomerates? So that was a, a study that we were continuing uh, the thesis work by um, uh, Matt Bear and Richard Bono uh, and sampling in 2012. And this is where things start to get sticky because um, uh, after this field sampling, we found out that there was another group, uh, a very large group that had actually started sampling two weeks prior to the time that we actually were out in the field, which of course is fine, um, but um, this was our first indication that this was going on by um, the geologists in Western Australia. Now, that group, um, this is the Jack Hills locality of some of our samples, and we actually sampled along a bed here, uh, and we sampled here because this was where the best preserved uh, conglomerates were actually um, exposed. Um, in the Weissadol study, they didn't actually sample the same bed. They sampled over here. Uh, it turns out in 2012, and we'll get to that later, uh, we do have one site um, that actually overlaps by there, just purely by coincidence. But um, in the, at least for the 2013 study, there's no overlap between their samples and, and our samples. Okay. So this is the, the kind of very large group that, that um, was involved in that kind of sampling. And, and what I'll do is I'll kind of uh, go through some of um, the criticisms of our work that they have brought up, um, um, both them and, and, and others, uh, to try to uh, see if we can get to some resolution of some of these questions. So the first point was that there's no magnetite in the Jack Hills cobbles. Now, um, that was surprising to us uh, because um, it's a mature phase. You should expect it uh, to be there. And um, a lot of work by Matt Dare um, is shown here in terms of the Jack Hills um, uh, rocks. Uh, there's magnetite there. And um, Matt's thesis was both in kind of defining this, um, looking at uh, this magnetic provenance. And um, I won't really talk about this, but in his paper, he actually. Um, as a fascinating study of the chromite grains. Again, chromite, something that we don't expect to be present in a sedimentary rock, but it's actually pretty common in Jack Hill's rocks because this is a common detrital um, you know, kind of Hedean mineral um, that we can, uh, this actually suggests a, a um, some ancient layered intrusive uh, source, uh, probably uh, maybe the oldest layered intrusive source uh, on Earth, um, which is preserved now in minerals. Um, and as I'll talk about later, he also talked about um, uh, magnetizations from the second lab that uh, um, confirm our, our prior analyses. So here are some of the, um, again, uh, microprobe analyses as well as EDS analyses here of some of the, um, some of the um, magnetites. There are some more. So there's magnetite there. So magnetite is present in SEM and, and, and microprobe, as expected. Um, as I said, there's lots of other things. There's oxidized magnetite, uh, kind of reaction rings here. Um, there's there's pyrite, uh, pyrotite. Um, it's uh, mainly hexagonal, which is interesting. 
and some of it is uh, sub-rounded. Now, um, this is kind of an, another important point, and it's kind of a point of departure uh, of our interpretations versus others. Um, we believe that this uh, pyrotype is, is the trial. Um, and it's trial, again, because it's swimming here within uh, the courts, and it's sub-rounded. Um, this is not what you expect in a younger sedimentary rock. Um, it's, again, this is the Vidin and the Artina. You can actually get this type of uh, uh, mineral uh, preserve. Um, other things, nickel phasers, uh, pentlandite. Here, again, something that you don't normally see as a detrital phase. Uh, smithite, another uh, nickel bearing phase. Um, and the chromites uh, that Matt spent a lot of time working on, um, sometimes in, in, in pretty good shape, actually, armored by these silica. <laughs> Um, um, particles. So um, the statements have been made that because pyrotite is present, it carries a secondary magnetization and, and uh, the jack kettles are completely remagnetized. Now, if you were dealing with a younger rock, perhaps you could say that um, in terms of a secondary magnetization. But again, we think it's actually a, a detrital phase. Um, and here are some of the other um, uh, pyrotites. And another important part about this is that um, there are some um, ones that are monoclinic. This is probably part monoclinic, part hexagonal. But most of them are actually hexagonal um, ones, which um, should not be actually a major uh, contributor to the remnant magnetization. The other thing that's really uh, striking for us is, at least in our interpretation, pyrotite has a very sharp, sharp bottom temperature. 320 degrees Celsius. Um, and that's not something that we, we see in the data, in, at least in our data. So um, again, we think that most pyrotype uh, is hexagonal. Uh, we think it's a detrital phase. And um, the coexistence of these multiple sulfur phases uh, within a, a single sample actually argues against um, any kind of pervasive um, hydrothermal source and argues for a depositional source. And in, in, in particular, the lack of this kind of very distinct temperature uh, range in, in uh, some of the data tells us that uh, there can actually be a magnetization that's preserved in these host rocks. Um, again, uh, now uh, I've showed you lots of pictures of magnetite, and, and some have said, well, magnetite that you've shown is multi domain, so it won't have high and blocking temperatures. Um, now immediately, some of you should realize that by NLA relaxation, or actually not NLA relaxation, by uh, metamorphic reheating, if, it's metam if it is actually multi-domain, it should be um, remagnetized all the way up until 580 degrees. But nonetheless, what did we actually say in, in our paper? What we said is that um, the size is identified, and again, Matt's um, Dare's uh, thesis work was trying to get at magnetic provenance. So we did actually sample sizes that were a little bit larger uh, to get some reasonable uh, microprobe data on them. And he recognized that they're multi-domain to pseudo secret domain. But our interpretation was that these were the uh, um, uh, tail to late large grain sizes of a distribution that actually goes to small grain sizes. Um, that is, we would find it remarkable if there were only multi-domain magnetite in such samples. That's a very unsedimentary type of thing. Um, it's testable. Uh, we can actually now go to um, revisit the samples. And now we're down to half a micron. Um, now we're down to 300 uh, nanometers. It's there. Uh, these are a bit fuzzy because we're actually looking through quartz to actually see these. Uh, down to 200 uh, nanometers and some elongated particles of 200 nanometers. So at this point, um, if we follow the work by um, uh, Adrian Muxler, uh group, we would say that we're already in the unblocking temperature range where we're going to get these high unblocking temperature magnetizations preserved. Preserve. So our conclusion is that uh, actually magnetite is present at the small grain size ranges as, as expected. Okay. Um, even further background now. Um, and this has actually been kind of a really interesting uh, realization for us. Um, 
there were lots of statements that were made, uh, again, by this competitor of a group, one of which was that the MIT magnetometer was exactly the same as the University of Rochester magnetometer. Um, this is the University of Rochester um, magnetometer on which these samples were measured. So this is a, uh, what we call a large bore um, uh, squid magnetometer. Um, here are the sensing coils. Now this is kind of the, the range of, of parameter space that's actually being used in, in the field right now. That is um, kind of at 75% what the pickup coils would actually look like. Uh, this is our small bore instrument, so we'll, we'll mainly be talking about spaces in here right now. Um, this is uh, from 2G, what uh, the sensing coil in the MIT instrument is, and this is what the watch instrument is. So they're not the same, um, and this will become um, interesting uh, later on, but um, the Rochester one has high resolution sensing coils, and um, we believe that's important for actually detecting some of the magnetizations um, that we've seen. Okay. Um, it's an important background because of, of this question. Now, um, I said that initially some members of this very large group said that there wasn't magnetite in the cobbles. Um, then others who were part of this group uh, published a paper uh, with Dustin Trail in 2016 saying that magnetite is present both in the cobbles and the zircons. So now it appears that we're getting to some agreement, but uh, now the claim is made that magnetite is present but the high and blocking temperature magnetizations are not present. Okay. Um, so what we did is um, we took our samples and um, so this is kind of uh, a, a, a nice illustration of what our sample looks like. That would be our sample in our measuring course. So again, our, our philosophy here is to try to maximize the signal. Um, we sent some samples to Lehigh uh, University, uh, Ken Kunama, uh, and uh, he has a less sensitive magnetometer, uh, but um, still partially filling that space. And um, he also saw some high and blocking temperature magnetizations, uh, more scattered uh, than our magnetizations, but uh, with some reasonable agreement as well as in here, but highly scattered magnetizations in his, but still a high and blocking temperature magnetization uh, similar to the direction that we had. So in our interpretation, we would say that uh, now we have two labs that are seeing these high and blocking temperature magnetizations. Um, and in fact, um, they exist. Uh, high and blocking temperature magnetizations. And importantly, the higher than the peak metamorphic temperatures are seen by two laboratories. What are the sources of some of the differences? I think we, we, we need to explore this more. Uh, the samples that were used in our study are here. This is a one centimeter cube. Some of the samples that were used um, in the other study are shown here in these kind of smaller uh, disc samples. Now, um, in our interpretation, again, what are we searching for? We're searching for this, uh, this kind of very weak detrital remnant magnetization that might be preserved here. Uh, this is, is really tough in a, in a quartzite, even in a large sample. Um, and I think when you're looking now at the samples that they looked at versus their sizes, I, I think the samples are too small um, relative to ours. So this is the difference. So I think that's part of the reason for some uh, of, of the differences in, in, in the data. There's probably differences in the samples. But we will point out that I mentioned early on that there was this one site where we actually had the same samples uh, recorded. And um, uh, interestingly enough, at that site, we both agree that it's been hit by lightning. But this is uh, um, the MIT data, where they do an AFD magnetization first, and then they get um, some scatter at the high and blocking temperatures. If you compare this versus our data, where we don't do the AFD magnetization, we get um, a, a linear uh, component to the origin. Both of the data have some um, scatter at around these intermediate temperatures. We can see through this. It's harder for them to see through it in, in their data. So these are uh, kind of interesting comparisons because the intensity here is not really an issue because there's stronger magnetizations. Uh, perhaps it has something to do with this AFD magnetization treatment, um, but we're able to see through um, probably some alteration of features here uh, better uh, with our samples than we're seeing in this samples. Again, samples from actually the same site, but um, both recording a, uh, we would interpret as lightning strikes. 
Okay, so I think um, there's lots of potential for other tests, and we certainly welcome um, those, and we would like to work with that group in trying to um, kind of really um, look at some of these differences. Okay, um, the discovery site. Now, that was the Cabo conglomerate. Now we're gonna go to the discovery site, um, this really cru crucial point, and we're looking at non-zircon um, magnetizations. This is the discovery site uh, shown here. And um, again, um, the claims that have been made about this is that the Jack Hills are affected by a pervasive overprint at uh, 1 billion years. And in part, some groups have said that this completely remagnetized the, uh, the Jack Hills. Well, the, unlike the Cabo conglomerate site, um, the site at the uh, discovery site is a pebble conglomerate. This is a one centimeter square um, reference. Now again, this is a site and this is material that we don't think is appropriate for doing a conglomerate test on because there's just too much internal shearing within the samples. And the samples would be too small, we think, to actually record this trial remnant magnetization. Um, nonetheless, um, what a lot of the argument has centered on is the fact that um, the uh, Weiss and all group did a conglomerate test on this material and came up with um, these uh, from three block samples that are shown here. And they've averaged them together. Uh, we've averaged them together as they have averaged them together and um, yielding these three magnetizations. Now, they've claimed that that magnetization is actually recording a one billion year old remagnetization direction. To get to that direction, however, what you have to do is average these three block means. Uh, this yields an uh, alpha 95 to 75 degrees. And they say that that is the reason that this records a one million year direction, one billion year old overprint directions because of this averaging. Um, this was actually brought up in a comment and then given the opportunity to reply by Richard Bono. Um, and it's important to point out that some people have said, well, Richard, in some way, I handle the data differently or relying on data differently. Um, all those things were untrue. Uh, what Richard did was just do exactly what had been done in the paper. He just reproduced the paper. Okay. And our objections are, are, are simple. Um, um, you know, what is kind of the alpha 95 that's reasonable to use for a interpretation? Um, I tell my students that, um, you know, we can use Watson tests or whatever, but, you know, it's sort of a smell test, too. Um, I tell my students that 30 degrees is about the number. If you get beyond 30 degrees, you're in real trouble. You know, some people will criticize me for that. They'll say, well, that's too generous. But if you get an alpha 95 above 30 degrees, you know, kind of determining whether or not that's just random or not, you're, 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 you're in trouble. This is 75 degrees. So we don't think that that is appropriate to say that that is a distinct direction. And that is um, the, the emphasis of, of our comment. Um, this is a low battery, so maybe you want to plug it in. Um, now, getting to this point about, um, you know, have we actually done something different um, than what was done um, in this paper? We have not, um, but it does raise an interesting point. If we had, um, there would be differences because um, we don't, we would not handle the data the way that uh, the authors handle the data. Uh, this is an example of some of their data and um, in this particular case, uh, the authors forced this to the origin. And again, there's this been this idea that this is a pure type magnetization. We don't believe it's pure type for two reasons. Again, here's the pure type carry temperature. It's way out of the origin. Okay. And it keeps on going. To us, it's got to be something else. Um, this is not a sample that we would fit to the origin. It means to us, it's not going into the origin. To us, this suggests that there's some unresolved component to magnetization <laughs> present. 
And, and that's really interesting. Uh, even in these very small samples, um, there's something else there. It may be a different story. Now, um, the authors of, of this paper um, interpreted this scatter as secular variation as well as um, you know, potentially some tectonic tilting. Uh, Richard looked at this, uh, just looked at um, the overprint direction, which they were claiming. This is what the overprint direction should be in terms of secular variation characteristics. This is the characteristic of the data. So clearly it doesn't, it's much more scattered than secular variation. So um, we don't believe it's secular variation. Um, more importantly, in terms of the hypothesis and the importance of use of this to say whether or not this is um, suggesting that this really crucial site, discovery site, is being completely remagnetized. The magnetizations of this and all of those don't actually get above the expected peak metamorphic temperature. So this is, is kind of a crucial point. And it's a crucial point that I have to emphasize here today. Um, I think we actually agree on this, but it has been emphasized. It's in the abstract volume. Again, saying that there is this kind of positive, um, that there is this negative um, conglomerate test. But in fact, it doesn't actually address the key question here because the unblocking temperatures don't get to the, the key temperature range. So um, addressing these two questions, we think that the pebble conglomerate tests and, and other field tests, they're not true field tests in the sense of testing whether or not there's a primary magnetization because they don't get to this high unblocking temperature um, step. Uh, we don't believe that this is a one million year overprint because the alpha 95 is, is just too large. Um, the data are incompatible with circular variation or also incompatible with local tilting. So what can actually uh, the source of this be? Um, some other things that, that do need to be resolved here are that uh, Richard Bono pointed out the fact that if you look at where their sites are, and they're in these kind of two triangles here, uh, they're plotting in the wrong units. Uh, Weiss and others said that this was out foundation. Um, and, and why is it such a crucial point? That's the discovery site, and that's their site. It's such a crucial point because at this locality, um, we know we have Hadean zircons here, but 50 meters away from here, we know we have younger zircons. And that's actually, it's been documented by several studies, and this is, it's actually the interpretation for tectonic rework of, uh, of the area. So you really need to know where you are. In response to this, um, th this group has actually uh, revised their site locations to now over there to actually look at the comparison between the two. They were there, and now they're over there, closer to the discovery site. So um, they're um, suggesting that there is a 200 meter error in, in this plot uh, that, again, Richard pointed out. Um, and we still think there's some uncertainty involved in here, and, and this really kind of needs to be uh, resolved. Um, but even if there is that uncertainty, this kind of um, begs the question of, the sites at the same site, these are different by 81 degrees. Again, much too large to be due to secular variation. Um, we suggested that there might actually be a misorientation error. Now, these samples are, are I believe, 10 years old, uh, sitting around in a laboratory um, and just uh, relatively recently measured. Um, they've said that there's only a one chance in 10,000 that this could be a misorientation error. And we find no basis for this. It's simply that when you take a hand sample, um, maybe somebody uh, made that 90 degree error. Um, maybe not, but it's, it's, um, it's something we can't explain right now. Now, returning to our question about this kind of, um, kind of interrupted study, uh, what is the lower unblocking temperature rocks in, the, in these whole rocks? Well, something that we studied was, and because we were really interested in this question, how how can we determine what the actual magnetization is? It seems to be at low unblocking temperature. What is this actually overprint? Um, we decided to study the, the uh, mineral fuchsite, which is a chrome mica shown here. And again, this is actually fairly common in the Jack Hills rocks. And we did uh, several types of analyses on them. Uh, this is one of the samples. Now to do the paleomagnetic analyses, we would actually take the mica out. This is just shown in its uh, quartz uh, host here. And we saw that there was actually relic 
iron uh, chrome uh, particles within it that we believe carry the magnetization. And um, Rory was able to do, um, Rory Cottrell was able to do single um, uh, crystal uh, magnetization studies on these and see that they actually had a relatively well-defined magnetization from individual oriented crystals. Um, these are uh, results uh, from her GRL paper um, with various unfolding scenarios. And, and we think that um, this is actually a, uh, the peak metamorphic um, overprint. Uh, the only other thing that we have available from the Yogarn is about 2.4 uh, billion years old. Those are, are the triangles here, I mean, I mean the, uh, the bread symbols here um, from uh, Alexei Smirnov's work. And uh, we believe that it's reasonable that this is actually a 2.65 um, uh, remagnetization and that's um, a 2.4 um, um, uh, billion year magnetization. The difference between the two is just kind of um, standard plate motion uh, considerations. Um, so we think we've actually found the overprint direction. Um, Weiss and all don't um, agree with that. Now they say that this is a Cambrian age magnetization. Um, we won't go into great detail on this, but um, again, this is inconsistent with their previous interpretation we think it's inconsistent with the age, geology, and actually the pole positions. Uh, finally, um, now this group has said, well, um, the fuchsite is not actually carried by chrome mica, it's carried by pyrotite. Um, they've said that, well, our compositional analyses only have EDS, uh, which is true, and uh, this is uh, not a, a microprobe analysis. So they are suggesting that this is actually pure type. The reason that we don't have microprobe is because this is a clay uh, and it's really hard to get detailed, uh, um, it's a mica, sorry. It's really hard to get detailed microprobe data on this. But here's where the quiz comes in. These are our data and they say they're, they're semi-quantitative and they say that this is actually pure type. So which student is want, wants to say what the issue is? Where's the sulfur? Where's the sulfur? Okay. Yes. It's not microprobe data, but you know, if you do an EDS, the sulfur in pyrotype just jumps out. Okay, these are chrome mica magnetizations. They're not Okay, pure time magnetizations. So I mean, we really need to, to kind of get away from this kind of mode of just sort of attacking all the research. Let's look at the data and actually, you know, if we get to the point of saying that there is pure type without sulfur, I mean, I, I think there's a problem. Let's kind of work together and, and kind of work through these problems. Okay, let's get um, back to the question of the low bulking temperature magnetizations. Um, we can actually now go back to those conglomerate sites. This was part of our study, and this is stuff that I'll go through quickly because um, uh, Richard has a poster on this. Uh, this is our method of actually looking at the interior of these. Um, Richard has actually developed really nice software to actually kind of look at um, using contouring algorithms as well as cluster analysis to see in very scattered data sets whether or not there's actually a coherent magnetization or not. And at low and black temperatures, he's actually identified this. And what is fascinating to us is that this low block and temperature magnetization, uh, it's actually intermediate and block and temperature magnetization, actually agrees really well with the Fuchsite direction, uh, and it's even better after unfolding. So uh, we think we've actually um, identified the overprint again. Uh, and interestingly enough, it's actually also seen in the, in the data from Weiss et al. that we see a disagreement between these directions. So finally, we have some agreement that at the um, at least at intermediate unblocking temperatures, there is this coherent magnetization. We believe it's 2.6 billion years old. Um, and, um, but it's, there's lots of other magnetizations. Now this is, this is the metamorphic overprint. This is still at low unblocking temperatures, and we think it has not completely remagnetized the Jack Hills. Um, there are other questions concerning the Jack Hill granites um, that um, I won't discuss today, but we think the existing um, uh, distributions need to be relooked at. Okay, um, finally, I'm gonna to get to the Jack Hill zircons. Um, now, uh, Jack Hill zircons are 
really important because, uh, and this discovery side is really important because about 12% of our, our, our uh, archaean um, or a DNA and age. Why did we convince ourselves that we could use these for, for these types of studies? Well, we convinced ourselves because we did something called a microcomer test. And I mentioned to you that we don't think we can actually use the quartz uh, part particles because they're too sheared, but uh, zircons are not. And what we did is we actually oriented, um, got oriented samples of individual zircons. Now these are, they do have a little bit of quartz around them, but we don't think that that's a problem. Uh, and we did thermal demagnetization on those to do a microconglomerate test and um, they passed uh, this test. That it does appear that there isn't a coherent overprint on top of those. So we think that these um, have survived any kind of uh, overprinting uh, direction. Now, uh, this is an example of, of kind of a zircon that we might look at. Um, I do want to kind of go through the numbers for you. Um, we start with about uh, 2,500 hand-picked zircons. Uh, we do not trust any zircon that's been in a geochemistry lab. <laughs> and the reason for this is because the geochemistry labs, they use big magnets to separate zircons. They use electrostatic um, uh, devices to break up zircon, uh, rock, host rocks. Uh, they use heavy metals uh, that to, to do separations. All these things are going to cause contaminations. We have to do this on one hand. Uh, out of those, there's only about uh, 1,200 that kind of pass visual inspections, ones that we can clean, convince ourselves that they're actually clean enough to actually use. Then out of those, um, there's only about 200 that have magnetizations. Uh, we set the threshold about one times 10 to the minus nine EMU that is reasonable to be measured with our, our magnetometer. Um, then uh, we, of course, uh, are going to lose quite a bit because uh, we're going to have various types of paleomagnetic uh, requirements for those. After we do all that work, then we actually cut them open and look at them, look at the interior of them. And we're doing SEM studies and doing lead lead analyses to actually make sure that the samples don't have cracks and, and other problems interior to the sample. And we lose uh, at least you know, quite a bit right there. So um, it's a bit sobering, but if you want to get involved in this business, just realize that you know, you're dealing with just a couple of percent from the original that we're actually looking at. And huge amounts of work that have been done in terms of actually looking at individual zircons to make sure that they're actually pristine. That's, that's what our data set is. And here are some of the Tellier, uh, Tellier analyses that were on those, uh, the ones that passed um, that uh, are shown. Um, and again, we're kind of looking at the field off steps and they have a criteria that they have to trend toward the origin. And these are the steps that we're actually going to uh, use. And these are the zircons after we've cut them open. And, and now we've done the, the lead, um, uranium lead analyses. Um, one of the limitations of the data set, and it is a limitation, is that um, there's only about 10% of the zircons, of all the zircons at even this discovery site, are, are Hadean in age. So um, these analyses, um, oops, sorry, these take about a week of measurement time. It's all week. Um, and remember that you're going to lose more than half of them because they're not going to meet any kind of criteria. So, um, you know, life's short, so we have to do something. Um, and what we did was uh, essentially look at those data and decide, you know, what temperature at which will we get some kind of reasonable estimate of paleo intensity. Um, and we chose 565 degrees because at that particular temperature, we could get something within a factor or two of the, of the true paleo intensity. So uh, we've done a series of other measurements that are just done at that one point estimate uh, where we're looking at um, essentially the estimate 565 degrees Celsius. And here are some of those other ones. Um, and this is actually uh, the result uh, and that uh, I, I kind of showed you. Now, we want to kind of move this forward we know that there is this other competing group. And, and um, one of the things that we really want to happen, and, and we really want this to be addressed, um, and we think it's a really simple thing to address, and, and I'm gonna ask for a public here today. When we published our paper, um, you know, 
we think everybody has the ability to actually publish their paper. They should have their paper published without any kind of prejudice. Um, that was sort of taken from us. Um, we had our paper published. In fact, an advanced copy was, was given uh, out to the group, and it was distributed uh, prior to publication. Um, now, where does this stand? Well, the, the, the group basically, um, you know, science formally asked, particularly Joe Kerstrink, where this paper was actually distributed. And um, it's been 18 months and there's been no reply. You know, we're just asking for something very simple. Um, the question I'll answer right now. We, we really want the group to kind of tell Science Magazine, you know, kind of where this went to. And, um, and, and so that we can actually talk to the authors and, and talk to the people that are actually went to so um, we know where this happened. And we also don't want this to happen again to anybody. You'll have time in the question period to actually talk about it. Okay, so we want that to be resolved and we think it can be resolved very quickly. Um, it's been 18 months, it has not been resolved. So we're going forward and one of the things that we want to look at are the gaps in this particular record. And um, we're going to uh, look at replication studies, uh, uh, interlaboratory um, uh, calibrations, and I'm just gonna briefly go through these things and other tests of reheating re uh, scenarios. Um, Interlaboratory calibrations. Now, all the measurements that we've looked at so far in the zircons are done in this very uh, small bore magnetometer. And uh, it's actually using this um, uh, coil uh, down here. For comparisons, we've actually used uh, the squid magnetometer being developed uh, in Japan by Roki Oda. And um, so what we did is we measured uh, the NRM of a zircon in our laboratory and then uh, mounted it in a sample and then, um, and then sent it to Japan. Um, and Rokini uh, did a scan of this. And uh, interestingly enough, the magnetizations agree pretty well, uh, which, is, which is interesting. And we hope to do more of these uh, types of tests. So there's kind of replication, at least at the, at the NRM level. Um, we're working on magnetic inclusions within those. Again, if you uh, are interested in this type of work, you should talk to Richard Bono. And um, Richard has been doing FIB work. This isn't coming out so well, but uh, he actually sees that there are actually inclusions, and many, many types of inclusions, some of which with, with uh, iron signatures, and we think that this is one potential host of, of the um, accusations within the zircons. Um, an important point about this, a technical point, is that um, we think we're actually uh, getting close to the limits of, of telemagnetism here. Um, and this is a paper that was written by Berndt. We, we disagree with some of their formalizations, but we, we, do dis we do agree with their overall point. And that is you need to have a certain amount of magnetic particles to get a reasonable magnetization to overcome these maximum Boltzmann limits. And we think we're getting close, um, but we think we're okay. Um, we, um, we, do think you have to look at an entire zircon to get enough crystals, to get enough uh, inclusions within it, and even some of these, now we've discovered that we can actually get hysteresis measurements on individual um, zircon crystals. So, um, reheating scenarios. Um, we actually uh, tested this in two different ways. So, <coughs> what's, what's the big issue here? Um, I spent a lot of time talking about Jack Hill's and secondary magnetizations on the Jack Hills. But a zircon that's four billion years old is, has a whole history that it can actually go through before it actually is deposited in this three billion year old um, uh, unit. Maybe there's some other uh, remagnetization events that we've missed there. Now, we tested this in, in, in several different ways by looking at lead loss and in the shrimp and um, uh, lead loss ages as well as a systematic search for non-systematic variations of lead during um, these analyses, which are characteristic of zircons that have been heated to infrabolactic granulate phases conditions. And um, it's important because uh, in several talks, it's been suggested that we're actually looking for diffusion 
and diffuse and lead would diffuse too slowly, so therefore we would not see um, um, any any signature. <coughs> but we're not actually doing this at all. Instead, we're looking for aqueous loss. The reason, the way that zircons lose um, lead is by aqueous processes, and that's what we're actually searching for: uh, aqueous uh, loss um, associated with um, uh, potential reheating events. And we expect there to be aqueous loss. Uh, they're heated in a hydrous crust, and everybody believes that these rocks are actually in a hydrous crust. So that's uh, these are the two tests that we actually use in our science paper. And again, uh, this is why it's really important for people to read that paper, and, and we would like to know um, and, and, and where the paper was distributed so we could actually talk to the people and kind of clarify this point. Um, we've used this new point, this new method, uh, also uh, um, lithium diffusion. Now, lithium is different from lead. Lithium actually diffuses quite rapidly under um, low um, uh, heating conditions, and it's essentially a good tracer. So um, we've actually looked at this using a Kamika machine on the same zircons, which yielded some of these uh, results. And we're going to uh, just concentrate on this particular zircon here and look at, at its cathode luminescence uh, range. And you can just barely see here these bands in it. These are primary um, um, bands, uh, crystal faces within the zircon. And we'll look at the lithium map we can see that the actual lithium is tracking these quite well. So this is actually preserved. So the lithium is actually preserved in, in this sample. We can do an analysis of these, uh, of these bands, and this is Richard Bono's work, and plot up using, as Trail did, um, uh, the thickness of those bands versus a nominal meat reheating age, one million years, or organic heat, and to get a bound on the temperature. And this suggests that this particular zircon since its formation, has not seen a temperature above 500 degrees Celsius. So over that entire range between when it actually formed, it was put within the Jack Hills. Um, what's astounding about this particular result is that this zircon is, is 4.2 billion years old. So again, to us, in, in our interpretation, this is confirming evidence that all of this work, all of these criteria that we applied, worked that we've actually been able to find those few zircons that actually um, preserve this very ancient magnetization, which we believe is as old as 4.2 billion years old. Now, uh, just briefly about the implications of this. Um, it turns out that, of course, the, the, the limits for any discovery of the Earth's magnetic field uh, are the lunar forming event, but the lunar forming event actually has uh, a new role for us. Um, and the interface of that is really kind of with this idea of, of um, which will probably be discussed uh, later today in terms of the uh, thermal conductivity values of the Earth. Now, uh, this has been a real shakeup in, in the discipline uh, since 2013, um, suggesting that these values are three times higher than our previous ideas, making it um, uh, harder to drive uh, convection in the core and have a, have a dynamo, and suggesting the inner core might be as, as young as, as a half a billion years old. Now, um, the presence of the magnetic field um, in the Paleoarchaean and Tahidean really has kind of provided motivation to search for alternative driving mechanisms. Where are we with thermal conductivity measurements now? Well. Um, this is a very rapidly moving field. Uh, as of 2016, there were two papers um, arguing for these high, new high, uh, from, um, high conductivity values in the core um, of 88 watts per meter um, per Kelvin. But the same issue of, of nature is a suggestion of even extraordinarily low uh, values um, by a different group. So, um, and even a further update in, uh, as of AGU, OTA uh, basically confirming their electrical resistivity measurements, but basically suggesting that maybe how they went from electrical resistivity to thermal conductivity may have led to an overestimate uh, ultimately of the thermal conductivity values. Something that's still being uh, debated, but um, really interesting times. Uh, nonetheless, uh, again, this uncertainty in thermal conductivity, the presence of the dynamo has driven other ideas. And um, 
one of them is this idea that, uh, starting from a theoretical model, that maybe we don't need the inner core at all, maybe that we don't need kind of normal thermal convection, but what we're dealing with here is chemical precipitation, particularly uh, in this model of manganese um, precipitation from the core. So why is that important in terms of the impact? Uh, it's important for the lunar forming impact because in this particular model, you require uh, kind of a superheated early core. And uh, small variations of that temperature uh, can actually cause either a almost instantaneous magnetic field or some delay of the magnetic field. So um, uh, this is um, uh, uh, a confirmation of this result from James Bodro, experimental result, where James is actually making little metal balls with silicate around them to study this absolution process. Um, there's going to be another paper that will come out, um, I think, next month uh, by Ki Hiroshi, who has uh, the idea that um, it's not manganese um, uh, absolution, but he, I'm not sure that he excludes that, uh, but he believes uh, it's uh, SiO2 uh, crystallization, um, and that's the light element uh, within the core, and uh, he believes that um, this alone is, is, provides uh, plenty of energy for the ge geodynamo, and we don't actually need the inner core. So um, really interesting times in terms of thinking about the generation of what the early dynamo might actually be like. So in summary, um, we think that the Earth, Mars, and Mercury um, all retain records of this very early dynamo, um, and it's uh, probably a common feature in terrestrial-like planets. Um, the um, Hedean geodynamo, with kind of the high to moderate core of thermal conductivity, uh, really suggests that there's some, we need some special process to cool a mantle. And this might be a physical process, maybe uh, some kind of huge uh, super plumes or, or heat pipes. But more commonly, what's being talked about is these compositionally driven convection models. Um, if these are true, um, in a core it may just be a minor player in terms of this. Um, if the thermal conductivities are at the very low end of the, the range that's come out from one of these studies, these diamond anvil studies, um, even studies in this particular range here, where there's been um, um, quite a bit of paleomagnetic work, these are results from our single crystals as well as results from others uh, that are in rocks that are dominated by, uh, uh, we believe, silicate-hosted um, uh, inclusions. Um, these could all be uh, an error where um, there could be an inner core. So, um, interesting times. Now, I haven't had uh, a chance to talk about this, but um, we do, and I, I talked a little bit about this in the abstract, I'd be happy to talk to people afterwards. We think the persistence of this atmospheric uh, shielding is really important for the long of dynamo, and we think that this is probably important uh, for development sustainability of Earth as a habitable planet, but its role actually shifted with time in terms of atmospheric composition. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Richard Bono and Rory Cortrell, who uh, Richard is, uh, and, and Rory have both been fundamental in doing a lot of this research, uh, made a, a lot of criticisms, and I think they've done just a tremendous job at um, uh, standing up to um, some of these criticisms. Um, and um, our data are available on uh, a database to, to have a look, and this has been supported by NSF. And the thing I would like to mention um, is that we uh, now have the opportunity for our visitors to come to our laboratory to learn some of these methods, and we would uh, invite um, anyone uh, from the competing group, from anyone who would like to learn about some of these methods, use some of these specialized magnetometers and techniques that we've developed uh, on similar projects or their own projects. Uh, please uh, contact us, and we would love to have you in our laboratory. Thank you. So thank you, John, for that uh, very detailed um, exposition. Um, and